and welcome to Heritage Baptist Church. Let's all find our places, grab a songbook, turn to number 281. Number 281 in your songbooks. Let's all stand together as we sing Jesus Saves. Number 281. We have heard. Welcome one another this evening. Find a way back to our seats. We're bringing it together on that third verse. Sing it out on the third. Sing above the battle strife. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. By his death and endless life. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing it softly through the gloom. When the heart for mercy craves. Sing it triumph for the on the last. Give the winds a mighty voice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free. Highest hills and deepest caves. This our song of victory. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. good warm up. Psalm 91 1 if you need it in your Bible. Psalm 91 verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Psalm 91 verse 1 and let's lift our voices and sing it together. Here we go. He that dwelleth in the secret place Psalm 139. I'm going to let Brother Rob come up and lead us in this one. Psalm 139. We've been learning it on Wednesdays, and it's just a great voice. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. Psalm 139. I'll let him tell you exactly which verses, and then we'll sing together. 
Psalm 139, verses 17, 18, and then verses 23 and 24. Psalm 139, 17, 18, 23, and 24. If you don't know it, get out your Bible. Psalm 139. Let's sing that together. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me. cast thy burden. I'm just, I just feel like singing scripture tonight. Amen. Cast thy burden upon the Lord. Psalm 55 verse 22. And let's sing it together. Here we go. Cast thy burden upon the burden upon the Lord. Just our voices now. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Cast thy burden upon the Lord. A lot of folks have, have burdens tonight. Be praying for the Bonarowski family. Uh, Gary, as we mentioned this morning, had the stem cell transplant on Friday. And uh, since that time, it's been up and down. At first, there was some kidney malfunction, and that seems to have straightened itself out. Uh, he's very, very tired. Uh, he ha his white blood cell count is gone, and so he is susceptible to anything. Uh, and everything right now, he's very, very tired, and uh, they, he has nausea issues and so forth. So they've, they've had a tough several days, and they've got a tough several weeks ahead of them. Uh, they're all there, of course, at the hospital tonight, so be praying. Uh, for the Bonarowski family. Cindy Ostrow, uh, one of our faithful ladies, sits over here every Sunday morning. Uh, she is having neck surgery tomorrow, and uh, I didn't say anything this morning because she was here, but she almost broke down in the back as she was telling me about it. Um, there, are, there aren't a lot of guarantees about that. She could wake up tomorrow afternoon paralyzed from the neck down. And uh, it's just one of those things, anytime you get into that part of the body, uh, it's very, very risky surgery, but it's something that's necessary for her. I did talk to her uh, about 15 minutes before service time, and I just make sure he's doing okay. And she said, I'm doing a whole lot better than I was this morning. She said, I need to be reminded that God loves me, so I'm okay. And uh, so she's going in. Her surgery's at 8.30 at St. Raphael's Hospital. Uh, she'll be there about 7, and uh, this, this is huge stuff. So be praying for Cindy, if you would. And then on a, on a brighter note, we have a visitor with us tonight. Tonight is the first time my granddaughter has ever come to church in her life. Finally, she got right with God. Uh, but Ellie Mae Bish, isn't that a cool name? How many automatically you think? <laughs> yes. And he's not even sure who the Beverly Hillbillies are, but uh, Ellie is here. You can look, but don't touch. I'm the only one allowed to carry, carry her around, me and Grandma. And uh, so uh, we're glad Carla's here, and, and she's recovering nicely, and we're glad for that. Thank you for coming out tonight. Lord, I pray you'll bless our service tonight. Lord, uh, we need to be reminded that there is a secret place where we can abide with you, and while we're there, we're safe. Lord, that we can take the burdens, no matter how big they are, and we can give them to you, and you'll sustain us with your grace and with your strength. 
And Lord, we're just thankful for scripture that we not only read and memorize, but we can sing and just put it in our heart. And Lord, remind us of these verses often. Lord, we pray for our church family, so many going through so many deep trials. Would you strengthen and encourage your people? Bless this crowd tonight, and Lord, as we open the Bible in a little while, may the Holy Spirit guide us into all truth. Bless Brother Martinez as he preaches to our dear Spanish folks tonight. Anoint him in a wonderful way. Lord, uh, a lot of things coming down the road with Friend Day and the baby dedication and so forth. Just help our church to have a hedge about it. May we pray one for another. May we pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to be evident all throughout the ministry. Thank you for being such a good God. And Lord, bless tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Take your songbooks and turn to number 335. Number 335 in your songbook, Showers of Blessing. For 335. There shall be showers of blessing. wonderful opportunity in Sunday school to be with missionary Brent Hoffman to the country of Panama. Uh, we got to spend some time with him along with uh, several others over at a, uh, a, a party the Filipinos had this afternoon. What a great young man, and uh, I, I hope you had a chance to meet him, and thanks for always being gracious to our missionaries. This Wednesday night, we have another opportunity. Umshama Kenyanga is going to be with us Wednesday night, our missionary to Tanzania. Uh, this guy's got a spirit that is just contagious, and uh, you'll just, if you've never met him before, you will love him, you'll enjoy him. Uh, coming home, first furlough, I believe, from Tanzania, and uh, uh, so uh, I don't think we ever got to meet his wife. I think she was having baby number one, and I don't know, they've had a couple since then, and uh, so you enjoy him. He keeps trying to talk to me about going to Tanzania, and I'm really thinking that I might, God might want me there, especially during the wildebeest migration. I would love to see that, uh, but he'll be here Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, so please make sure in your places. We will have Patch the Pirate on Wednesday night, uh, ages 4 through 6 grade and uh, so all of that will go as normal at seven o'clock uh, Saturday morning going out soul winning uh, we are on the, the the final two weeks before friend day we have a lot of work to do a lot of people that need a visit and uh, so let's be praying about that join us at 10 o'clock Saturday morning we pair up and we're gone by 10 30 and uh, so please be here and be a part of that next Sunday at 4 45 deacons will meet in my study uh, for a brief deacons meeting and then of course next Sunday is our our uh, last Last Sunday with Brian and Heather Wilson as they uh, get ready to make their move to uh, Trenton, Missouri, where he'll become pastor there. Uh, ne next Sunday night, Brother Wilson's going to be preaching for us. The last time uh, we'll get to hear him for a while. And uh, so there'll be a fellowship right after the evening service. Please, please bring a finger food or a dessert, and we'll just enjoy a wonderful time uh, with our dear friends Brian and Heather Wilson. Uh, friend Day, 
Uh, it's two weeks from today. We have lots of, of invitations. We'll just keep putting them out. The stack keeps going down. We keep putting new ones out there. Invite anybody that you can. Uh, somebody said, well, uh, can I invite my family? They're, they're not technically a friend. I said, anybody. If they're breathing, bring them. And uh, we're just going to have a wonderful day. And uh, some great incentives to encourage everybody to get involved in things for the young people, for the teens, for the adults. And uh, let's be praying for God to do something wonderful that day. And uh, we're, we're just asking uh, for some miracles and to see a lot of people get saved. And I almost forgot about this. We, uh, this year... Our theme is a renewed church, and uh, among the things that we are, have renewed is we have renewed the Fisherman's Club. And uh, so this year, when somebody wins someone to Christ, their first one for the year, uh, we induct them. They get their name on the uh, display out by the office, and they get their fish hook. Jesus said, follow me, and I will make you what? Fishers of men. And we get to induct somebody new. Caleb Hester won his first soul to Christ on Teen Soul Winning on Friday. So praise the Lord for that. Glad to see we got several teenagers up there now. <laughs> Walking up in front of everybody. And uh, so praise the Lord for that. And that's a, that's a good thing. Baby dedication Sunday, October 9th in the morning service at 11 o'clock. we got five or six little ones signed up. And uh, be praying about the day on baby dedication Sunday. There's always a lot of visitors that come. Uh, grandparents come, aunts and uncles, cousins, and so forth. And uh, so it's a great opportunity to reach some people. We don't normally get the opportunity to do so. So you be praying for that. If you've not yet signed up your little ones for that, please do so in the bulletin board uh, out in the hallway. This coming Tuesday is every lady on our staff's favorite day of the year. It is school picture day. I have seven or eight ladies that are very upset with me, but Smile, it'll be okay. We'll Photoshop some new faces on and it'll be great. Those of you that do have kids in our school, please have them ready. They don't have to wear their uniforms that day. We do ask that it does follow school uniform guidelines, though, as far as length and all those things. A lot of our boys dress up, suit and tie type thing. It's, some, it's an occasion to look nice. And a lot of kids don't do that anymore. So let's do that on Tuesday if possible. And uh, at the end of this week, this coming weekend, uh, there will be dozens of small children running around our church trying to sell you a pie. It is the Lyman Pie fundraiser coming up. Um, and I know it's early, but think about it this way. It saves you from having to bake pies at Thanksgiving. They're not bad. They just sit in your freezer for a whopping four days, and then you bake them, and it saves you a lot of time and effort, and it helps our school. Uh, I also wanted to just put this at full disclosure. We knew Ellie Mae was associated with the Clampets. We're just OCD with rhyming, and it rhymed with the other three names. So I just... <laughs> <clears throat> teens, make sure you're up this Friday, 345. We'll meet upstairs in the high school chapel uh, for the beginning of teen soul winning. And, uh, and then after that at 630, we'll have our teen activity this Friday, the scavenger hunt night, and we'll have a good time with that. Uh, it's $2 a person. And if you have any questions about any of that, you can come see me after the service. Take your songbooks once again, if you would, please. Turn to number 75. Number 75 in your songbooks. Let's all stand together as we sing the sweet by and by. Oh. 
may be seated. I encourage you to be faithful with your tithes and offerings. You can watch that number above the door as it continues to go up and just take a note of where uh, your giving is going to and what it's helping to accomplish. I'm going to ask uh, Brother Lacombe if you please come and pray for offering this evening. Dear Lord, we just thank you again for allowing us to be here tonight, Lord. Lord, we just uh, lift up our preacher to you tonight, Lord. We pray for um, uh, his health, Lord. We pray for his headaches, Lord. We just uh, pray, Lord, that you give him comfort, Lord. Uh, use him tonight, Lord, to speak to us. Lord, use him, Lord, to um, bring the message, Lord, that you put upon his heart for us, Lord. Lord, we pray, Lord, that we leave here tonight different than when we came. Lord, we just ask now that this offering be used for your honor, for your glory, Lord, for this church, for the ministries here and around this area, and for our missionaries abroad. Lord, watch over them. Please take care of them. Bless them, Lord, that the things that they do uh, keep their families safe. Lord, we love you, and we thank you again for all that you do. We ask this all now in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your Bibles, go to the book of Micah and chapter number six. The book of Micah, chapter number six. We'll be reading verses six through eight tonight. Micah six, verses six through eight. And when you have found that, we'll invite you to stand with us as we read the word of God tonight. <clears throat> Micah chapter six, beginning at verse six, the Bible says, Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? And let's read verse 8 in unison now. He has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. And let's go ahead and pray. Father, we do thank you again for the good day you've given to us. We thank you for the Brother Hoffman that you brought our way to remind us again of the importance of missions and the work that's going on all around this world to try to bring folks to Christ. And Lord, we just thank you so much for the burden that you've given to him. And Lord, for sharing that burden with us this morning. And Lord, we just pray that you'd be with us this evening now as we hear once again from the word of God that you would challenge us. Lord, help us tonight. Through the preaching of your word, again, we pray that you would strengthen and help our pastor now as he brings the message. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. There's a covenant sweet, it was written for me. It's a promise that I could be healed from all my sin and my shame, even heartache and pain. It was signed and confirmed on a hill. So I rest my case at the cross. For now I have someone to champion my cause. I've been justified, satisfied, oh I have it all. 
so I rest my case at the cross. Don't feel sorry for me when you see I'm in need. There's a judge who grants mercy and love. All my burdens he lifts, all my sins he forgives. Every trial is won through the blood. So I rest my case at the cross. For now I have someone to champion my cause. I've been justified, satisfied, for oh, I have it all. So I rest my case at the cross. I've been justified, satisfied, for oh, I have it all. So I rest my case at the cross. Amen. Thanks, Brother Tim. If you have your Bibles open to Micah chapter number 6, we're going to look at some familiar scripture and uh, perhaps uh, learn some things that we did not realize before. Micah is included in our Bibles in a section that we call the Minor Prophets. Uh, there are a number of them, and their books are much smaller in length than the major prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and so forth. Uh, Micah lived in a region that was about 20 miles south of Jerusalem, so he was from the southern portion of the nation. And unlike many of the prophets, for example, Hosea prophesied to the northern nation of Israel. Um, others prophesied only to the southern kingdom of Judah. But Micah was given an unusual ministry in that God directed him to have sermons both to the north and to the south. And he covered all of the Jewish people. Uh, Micah's most famous prophecy is found in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2 if you want to look there for a moment. And this is where the Lord foretold hundreds of years before the birth of Christ where he would be born. But thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. This is the verse that the uh, chief priests and the scribes uh, revealed to King Herod when uh, the wise men came saying, where is he that is born the king of the Jews? But equally as, as familiar to us as the prophecy of the birthplace of Christ is the verse in Micah chapter 6 in verse 8. If you'd look at it, we read this with Pastor Wilson. He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Now before we look at that verse and look at from some familiar words, we need to look elsewhere in this chapter and we need to understand the heart of God towards his people. Look if you would please in verse number two. Hear, O ye mountains, the Lord's controversy. In other words, God's got a problem with you. God's got a controversy and he wants to deal with it. He's going to confront you about it. So hear, hear, O ye mountains, hear ye, O mountains, the Lord's controversy, and ye strong foundations of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with his people, and he will plead with Israel. Now notice what God says in verse 3, O my people, what have I done unto thee, and wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. God's speaking to the people that he redeemed. God is speaking to the people that he gave them a land. He drove out the inhabitants uh, before them. God gave them great cities. God gave them great victories. Uh, their, their history with God is an amazing one. God treated the nation of Israel as he has treated no other nation in the history of the world. God gave them the word of God. They were the only nation that, that, that were privileged to have what, what are referred to as the oracles of God. Uh, they had preachers. They had prophets. Uh, God 
God had treated Israel with such great care. They were truly God's chosen people. And now God is asking them a question. And I want you to see the anguish in the Lord's heart. He said, oh, oh my people, what have I done unto thee? What did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? Wherein have I wearied thee? In what way have I been too hard on you? In what way have I, have I caused you to be bored with me? You're tired of me. What did I do? Was the manna not exciting enough for you? Was the parting of the Red Sea uh, not enough for you? Was me giving you a kingdom unlike any other? Uh, was my temple not good enough for you? Uh, wherein have I wearied thee? And I wonder if sometimes if God looks down in the year 2016 and he looks at his people and he asks us the same thing. What did I do that made you get so tired of me? You're tired of my Bible. You're tired of my church. You're tired of my service. You're tired of preaching. You're just, you're just tired of me. And I think I wonder sometimes if God looks down and said, what did I do that I bored you so badly? Wherein have I wearied thee? He asked them in verses 4 and 5 to remember just a couple of instances in their history where, where God stood up in their behalf. Verse 4, for I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, redeemed thee out of the house of servants, and I sent before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. And he reminds them of all of their days in Egypt, their rich history. Verse number 5, O my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, consulted, and what Balaam the son of Beor answered him from Shedem unto Gilgal, that ye might know the righteousness of the Lord. Balak was a king who wanted this prophet named Balaam to pronounce a curse on the nation of Israel. And it was believed that if he made the curse, that it would come to pass. But every time Balaam went to open his mouth, instead of a curse, God put a blessing in there. And they tried it from uh, three different times, from three different locations. And every single time, the promises of God's power and blessing on Israel was stronger than the time before. And Balak's people, the curse actually was turned back on them. And God said, did you forget how I turned the, the, the curse into a blessing for you? And when he's talking here, when he says that she may know the righteousness of the Lord, he's saying, I want you to understand, I've always done right by you. I have never led you wrong. I have never told you the wrong thing. I have never treated you wrongly. I have always been just and righteous and holy and fair in my treatment. So why are you so bored with me? He, then there's a question here from the prophet Micah. And he's putting himself in the place of the people in their mindset. Wherefore shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Now this seems like almost a confusing thing, but Micah asks a series of questions, and as he does so, I want you to understand he goes right to the consciousness of the, the, of the, the Jewish people, the people of God. The first thing he talks is about their religious service to Jehovah. Uh, about their coming to the temple that was still standing in that day and offering their sacrifices. And by the way, they did those things. They would come in and they'd offer the sacrifices morning and evening. They'd bring their peace offerings and their burnt offerings and all of those things. And some of those people were very meticulous about that. Some of them even went above and beyond. Uh, on one time, Solomon offered 22,000 sacrifices on one given day. And he addresses the consciousness of the people because in their minds, they say, hey, look, we went to the temple and we offered all those sacrifices. That ought to be good enough. As if going through the motions and going through the routine was really all that God was looking for. That God was standing there uh, at the door with a punch and as long as you came in, he could punch your ticket that you showed up and you offered the sacrifice and you could go merrily on your way. And so uh, Micah is saying, uh, with their mindset, shall I just offer rivers of oil and all of these things? But then he also hit a nerve with them because he asked two more questions that don't seem to fit with the first two. He said, shall I come before him? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, verse 7. He said, shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? 
The people of Judah, especially in those days, what, what they did is they served God out of one, one, on one hand, and on the other hand, they did their own thing. And right outside the city of Jerusalem was a little valley that was called the Valley of Hinnom. And in that valley, they had, a, they had an altar to a god by the name of Molech. The idol of Molech was actually made out of metal. And in the belly of this idol, if you can think what a statue of Buddha would look like, that is where they would build the fire. And the ancient historians say that the god Molech was designed in such a way that his, his iron arms were stretched out like this over that belly and they'd build a fire in there until literally the iron would be glowing red. And the way you worshipped Molech is you brought your firstborn child and you brought him there into the valley of the son of Hinnom and you laid your firstborn child alive on those red hot arms and you stepped back and you listened to your child scream and your child scream supposedly pleased the god Molech. So you have God's people on one hand go into the temple that Solomon built under the direction of the Holy Spirit of God, offering the sacrifices that were given to them in the Word of God, each one of them picturing the final sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And they're going there, and they're looking like good Jews. They're looking like observant Jews, and, and they're, they're going by the letter of the law. And then they're turning around, and they're going down to the valley of the Son of Hinnom and offering their sacrifice there. You say, Pastor, why on earth would anybody do that? Because you see, the, the God Molech, uh, the, the, the way the mindset was, uh, Molech, you offer that sacrifice, and that might be a terrible thing, but you get to live any way you want when you worship Molech. You don't have to be moral with Molech. In fact, immorality is encouraged. Prostitution and all those things were very much a part of that religion. Uh, the truth is, in the mindset of the day, uh, there's a whole lot more fun down at the house of Molech than there was in the temple of Almighty God. And, and Micah, in those questions that to us just don't seem to fit together, he's pointing out the problem. He said, over here, you're going through the motions of serving me, and then you're leaving me, my presence, and going down here, and you're committing things that are abominations in my sight. And God is saying, what have I done to weary you? What has Molech ever done for you? What prayer has Molech ever answered for you? And, and, and it's, in essence, what he's saying is, what has the world ever done for you that is so awesome that you're bored with God? Amen. So he asks these questions, these probing, convicting questions. And then he says in verse number eight in those familiar verses, he hath showed the old man what is good. As I studied this verse out, I was reminded all through Scripture how many times God said, and he's the God who ordained the sacrifices in the temple, that that's really not what God wanted from his people. What he wanted was their heart. What he wanted was their faith. What he wanted was their yieldedness to him. And their sacrifices without those things meant absolutely nothing to God. Not at all. He says, he has showed the old man what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee. And then he lists three things. Here's what God wants from his people. He said, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. You see, they were good at the sacrifices. They were bringing in lambs and bulls and all that kind of stuff. But they weren't doing these things. And so, basically, God was telling me, your sacrifices mean absolutely nothing to me. Here's what I want. John, I want you to do justly, and I want you to love mercy, and I want you to walk humbly with thy God. This trinity of truth is found elsewhere in the Bible. Flip a few pages back to the book of Hosea. Right after the book of Daniel, Hosea chapter number 12. Hosea pleads very much as did the prophet Micah in chapter 12 and verse 6. He says, therefore turn thou to thy God. Keep mercy and judgment and wait on thy God continually. 
The wording is a little different. The order is a tad different, but it's actually the exact same thing that Micah told God's people to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with thy God. Look, if you would, to Matthew chapter 22. This isn't just Old Testament. This is New Testament doctrine. Matthew chapter 22. Jesus is addressing the scribes and the Pharisees. They were masters at going through all of the routine, but their hearts were so very, very far from God. By the way, Jesus wasn't upset that the Pharisees had high standards. He was upset that that's all they had. They had no love for God. They had no walk with God. They were arrogant. Uh, they were selfish. Uh, they were prideful. And uh, that's what he had against them. Look, if you would, please, Matthew chapter 22 and uh, verse number uh, 23. And let me see, is that where I want it? Yeah, I was in Matthew 22, and that's why I just didn't, didn't look right. It's 23, verse 23. Jesus says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. And look at this, judgment, mercy, and faith. If you will, that's that same trinity that he had in Micah 6, 8, to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with thy God. Judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. He wasn't condemning them that they were meticulous about tithing. He said, but you're tithing down to the smallest little detail and you think that's awesome. He said, but you've left off judgment, mercy, and faith. Your tithing means nothing because you've left, you've left the, the weightier matters of the law undone. We want to talk a little bit about God's prescription for the pleasure of God tonight. I want you to go back to Micah 6, and we're going to look at this little trinity that God places several times in the Bible for us. The first thing God says that he requires of us is to do justly. The word justly means to render, or to do justly, that phrase means to render a right verdict. To render a right verdict. Uh, we have been dismayed in our country in, in the last year or two at the highest court of the land in some of the verdicts that they have passed on and made judgment calls that have affected life everywhere. We've been astounded and, astounded and dismayed as they, they've taken it upon them to dismantle the biblically founded uh, grounds of marriage, one man and one woman, and all of those things. They are rendering a verdict. To do justly means you render a right or a righteous verdict. It means to pass right judgment. It means to look at a situation. It means to look at an action or an activity uh, and, and, and render the verdict that this is right or this is wrong. This is moral or this is immoral. This is holy or this is unholy. Bible said it is required of me that I am to do justly. And I am to render a right verdict about whatever issue comes along. And I'm not only to render the verdict, I live according to what that verdict is. The word judgment and the phrase to do justly are tied in. They, they mean exactly the same thing. That's why back in Hosea chapter 12 and verse 6 and in Matthew 23, 23, it used the word judgment rather than the phrase to do justly. In Proverbs 21 and verse 3, God said to do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. He's addressing that same issue that Micah did. You walk in and you go through the motions of all of these things, but in your day-to-day -day lives, you're not doing justice and judgment. You are not rendering a righteous verdict about this activity or this action. And, and think about this. Think about the worship of Molech, the sacrificing of their firstborn. There were the, the people in that day that were doing that, and in their minds they were justifying it in all kinds of ways, but there is no way that a, that, that a thinking person can even look at that and say that cannot possibly be right. But especially someone to whom had been given the word of God that specifically talked against human sacrifice and all of those things. There's no way that they were rendering a righteous verdict. They were not doing justly. 
Turn your Bibles to Isaiah chapter number one. If you want to keep your place in Micah, we will be back there. Isaiah chapter number one. Isaiah and Micah were contemporaries, and it's interesting that their sermons were very similar. In Isaiah 1, in the first message recorded from this prophet, please look at verse number 11. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. The word vain means empty, and oblations means offering. Don't bring any more things into my house that mean nothing to you. Don't even, don't even bother with that. Incense is an abomination unto me. But wait a minute. Think about that statement. Incense is an abomination. In the holy place, in the temple of God, there was a, an altar made of gold, and it was called the altar of incense. And on that altar, they were commanded by the Lord to offer incense and burn it on the coals there, a, a, a special mixture that could only be used there. They were commanded. And now God is saying, your incense is an abomination to me. They were, they were doing what they were told to do in that case, but God said it's an abomination. We'll read on. We'll find why God said that. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, all the things required in the law. He said, I cannot away with. He said, I, I, I just can't, I, I can't tolerate them anymore. He said, it is iniquity. Even the solemn meeting, your new moons and your appointed feast, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. When you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. You've got all kinds of wickedness on your hands, and here you are in my temple offering incense and offering sacrifices here, and it's all empty because your hearts are so far away from me. Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek what? Judgment. Rendering a righteous verdict. Seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Isaiah's message mirrors that of Micah in an amazing way. Render a righteous verdict. So here's the question. Who determines right from wrong? Who gets to decide that? We live in a culture today, very much like the culture in which Isaiah and Micah did. No, there's nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. Human nature has always been what human nature is since the fall in the Garden of Eden. But our culture today said there's no such thing as absolute right and wrong. I remember in the late 60s, early 70s, sitting in philosophy classes in my public school, and that's what they were teaching. We had to read a book. It made no sense then. It makes no sense now called I'm Okay, You're Okay. Anybody ever hear that? That book is not Okay. It's a good book for wrapping cigarettes or something like that. But, it's, it, it, but, but basically what it says is, if it's okay for me, it's okay. If it's okay, something else is okay for you, that's okay. Now, that, that's good in some things. Um, you know, there are, there are some people, when you go out to eat, you want comfort food. Right? How many are like that? Mashed potatoes, gravy, that kind of, How many are like that? Okay? So some people, that's your idea of a meal. If, if you have a higher IQ, you go for Italian. Now, the truth is, if it comes to comfort food and you like that kind of stuff, fine. I, I like Italian. That's fine. There's, there's, real no, there's no morality involved in that. Okay? But there are things that, that God has some things to say about. Morality is a big issue. That's what we live in the world today. Well, I, I'm a man, but I feel like I'm a woman today, so that's okay because that's the way I see myself. And, and our, our culture is cramming that down our throats. And here's the sad thing. The church isn't there yet, but we're moving in that direction. And basically what we're saying is even biblically, there aren't as many absolutes as we've always been told. And so it's up to us. We get to decide for ourselves right and wrong. So I may decide on an issue of holiness or unholiness in one way, and John may decide in another, and according to the world's philosophy, we're both right. 
You realize two people can't decide on something and decide differently and both be right when it comes to issues of right and wrong, holy, unholy, moral, and immoral. They can't both be right. Molech and the temple of God don't coexist. So who decides? Look, if you would, to the book of Judges. Like I said, this nothing new, this, this mentality that it's up to me to decide. Judges chapter 17. From this chapter to the end of Judges, we read of some of the most disturbing events in Israel's dark history. When, when they were under the rule of the Judges, and uh, here's what the Bible says. I mean, if you read through there, some of it just makes you scratch your head saying, what on earth were these people thinking? In one case, a man, uh, he, he, had, he, had, uh, he was surrounded in a house by a bunch of men saying, come on out that we might know you. They were a bunch of homosexual men. He said, no, that would be a sin against God. Here, take my concubine, do whatever you want. They abused her so bad that night that she died. So his response was to hack her into 12 pieces and send a body part to all the 12 tribes of Israel. We're talking a messed up culture. Here's what the Bible says at that time. In Judges chapter 17, look at verse number 6. In those days, there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right, read the next few words, in his own eyes. Every man said, I get to decide the judgment call. Again, we're not talking about do you like mashed potatoes and gravy or do you like lasagna. We're talking moral, immoral. We're talking righteous, unrighteous. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Judges chapter 21. And this is how the book of Judges ends. In those days, there was no king in Israel. God says the same thing again. Every man did that which was right, how? In his own eyes. Now, I'm to do justly. According to the scripture, I am to render righteous judgment. Someone or something has to be the arbiter of what is righteous and unrighteous. Uh, as you know, I'm, a, I'm a, a fan of World War II. I, I'm just a history buff when it comes to that. And, and, and I'm just reading uh, all the time about that era in history, trying to understand, especially the mindset uh, of, of not the Nazi movement throughout Europe. And, and, and what could cause people to do that? I, I'm reading one of the most fascinating books that I've ever read on, on uh, the subject of Auschwitz. Auschwitz was the number one death camp. Uh, it was actually in Poland. It was not in Germany, but it was run by the Nazis. 1.2 million Jewish people died at Auschwitz. At its, at its highest peak, they were murdering 40,000 people a day. They did not just murder Jews, they, mur they murdered gypsies, uh, they murdered communists there, uh, tens of thousands uh, of communist soldiers from the Red Army, the Soviet Army, that were captured in World War II were taken to Auschwitz, and many of them were killed uh, almost immediately, but the, uh, the vast majority were Jewish people. Uh, I, I won't go into all the details about things, but, but they sent 4,000 Jewish children from France in 1941 to Auschwitz, children. One person who was in France who helped deal with those children and put them on board the cattle cars that took them across France and all the way into Poland to Auschwitz recalled seeing a three and a half year old boy. They'd already taken the mothers and shipped them off and these children were left alone. He said there was a three and a half year old little boy. He said he was a beautiful child and he was just standing there crying, where's my mommy? Where's my mummy? I can't find my mummy. And somebody just picked him up and threw him on a cattle car. Every one of those children were murdered within moments of their arrival at Auschwitz. And the world has sat back and said, how could they do that? How do you rationalize the brutality? How do you rationalize the cold-blooded, systematic killing of six and a half million Jewish people by the way, there were about another 6 million non-Jewish people who died in that war. The author of this book did, did a number of commentaries and documentaries for the BBC. 
after World War II. He spent, he, he actually spent all of his life 30 to 40 years interviewing people. He, he studied uh, the Nazis. He studied uh, the Soviets. Uh, he also studied imperialist Japan. He's trying to get into the mindset of, of how do you do these things. Some 30 years after the war, some of these uh, SS guards at the camps and so forth were finally becoming free and willing to talk about things. At first, they just, they hid behind the mantra of, well, we were just following orders. But when they were no longer worried about reprisals and, and judgment had been passed and they were serving their sentences now and they knew they no longer had anything to lose, they began to talk a little freer about this. And of course, you've heard just a smattering of what, have I, what I've told you about. Some of you perhaps know far more detail and have studied it out more than I am. We're appalled by the Holocaust. We're, we're, we're sickened by what happened. But they talked to Rudolf Hess, who was the man who ran Auschwitz for almost all of its existence except for one brief six-month period where he was removed for a time, but then he was brought back in. He's the one that designed the gas chambers, designed the crematoriums, designed the entire process. Ask if he regretted what he did as, right before he died. He said, oh, absolutely not. What we did was right. The Jews were the enemies of Germany. And you don't allow your enemies to live. The, the author of this book went on and, and pressed him. He said, but, but children, little children. He said, little Jews grow up to become big Jews. It's the blood. And you have to destroy it because otherwise it's a plague that would destroy Germany. I see a whole lot of people going like this. But you see, they became the arbiters judgment they rendered a verdict they actually thought they were doing the right thing they thought that's what they needed to do to preserve germany it wasn't just that well we know it was wrong and we probably shouldn't have done it but they didn't think it was wrong they believed in the core of their being that they were doing the right thing because, you see, they were allowed to decide that for themselves. They were allowed to decide and render their verdict of righteousness on their own. Can you see how dangerous that is? Can you see how confusing that is? So where do we get? Where do we get a foundation for judgment? Psalm 19. Psalm 19. Look, if you would, please. Verse number seven, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Do you see that word in there? The judgment. In other words, God has already rendered the verdict as to what is righteous and unrighteous, what is holy and unholy, what is moral and is immoral. And the Bible said, notice again, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. God never makes a bad judgment call. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. So if I am to do justly, if I am to render a righteous verdict, I cannot trust. The, the Bible says several times in Proverbs, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is what? the ways of death. We cannot trust what we think about it. We have a fallen nature. We have a limited understanding. We have an infinite God, though. We have a holy God. We have a perfect God, and he has rendered his judgment, and the judgments of the Lord are contained in the word of God. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 119, which is one of the greatest chapters exalting the Word of God and its power and its place in our lives that you will ever want to find. We'll look at just a few verses. Psalm 119 and verse 7, David said, I will praise thee with uprightness, uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy what? Righteous judgments. David's acknowledging God's judgments are righteous. They are perfect. Look, if you would, in verse 39. 
Turn away my reproach which I fear, for thy judgments are what? By the way, that Satan comes into conflict with much of today's present philosophy. We live in a world that now calls evil good and calls good evil. Anybody who stands for traditional marriage is a hater. We don't hate anybody. We just love God. We're not out stoning people. We're not, not out swearing at people. That's the other crowd doing that to us. But we live in a world that wants everybody to think that if you stand for traditional biblical marriage, you're a hater, you're this, you're that, you're the other thing. But, but uh, David makes us understand that God's judgments are good. They are good. Look at verse number 75. David said, I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right, and that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me. God said the soul that sinneth it shall die. God put warnings out there about if you disobey me, there'll be results that come along on that. David did that a few times in his life. Remember a bit with Bathsheba. He violated God's judgment of marriage, and he took another man's wife, and he betrayed his own marriage vows to his wife. He committed adultery, breaking another of God's judgments where God rendered and said that's an unrighteous act. He tried to cover it up, violated another of God's judgment. He ended up orchestrating the murder of Uriah the Hittite. Thou shalt not kill. That's God's rendering of the verdict against that subject. And David violated the judgments of God, but those judgments when violated carried a penalty. David is stepping back. He's endured the, the, the chastisement of God. His little child uh, died in infancy. Uh, David had problems in his kingdom. David, David uh, uh, paid a great deal for a, a night of pleasure and a night of passion. But David makes this statement afterwards. He said, I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right. You were right to render that verdict against me and that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me. Look if you would to verse 137, same chapter. Righteous art thou, O Lord, and upright are thy judgments. Thy testimonies that thou, art, thou hast commanded are righteous and very faithful. Here we see that the righteous, the word righteous and the word judgments put together. So in other words, if I'm gonna do justly, if I'm going to do justly like Micah 6, 8 says God requires of me, that means I am rendering righteous judgment. That means I can't go by what I think. I can't go by what you think. I can't go by what the world thinks. I have to open this book and see what God says. And I have to determine in my heart whatever he says is good, whatever he says is righteous, whatever he says is true, all together. And I, to do justly means I do according to his judgments. David said in, in Psalm 119, 7, again, I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. That means in every decision that we make about right and wrong, moral and immoral, holy and unholy, we need to be able to go to the word of God and say, this is why I have rendered the judgment and I, that I did because it's found in the word of God in this manner. Um, to do justly to do justly. We live in a world that doesn't want to really do that so much. Even modern day Christianity doesn't want to do that. We want to kind of do our own thing and say, well, God has his stamp of approval on that. Um, God's word's pretty clear about things. And, and we ought to listen to the prophet Micah. We ought to listen to the prophet Hosea. We ought to listen to the savior that said, look, your tithing is fine. You ought to have done that. that. That was okay. And the sacrifices, yeah, God commanded them in the incense, but you see, they don't mean anything. They're, they're vain oblations. Because you're just going through all the motions with that, but you're not doing justly with your life. You need to learn to do judgment. Go back to Micah 6, and we'll hasten. The second thing that he said in both, in, in all of Micah 6, 8, Hosea 12, 6, and Matthew 23, 23, he said, what does the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy? To love mercy. Jesus taught in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5 and verse 7, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. To love mercy means that we love showing mercy as much as we love receiving mercy. 
Let's go back to David for a moment. He had committed the sin with Bathsheba. He had orchestrated the murder of her husband, then married her and tried to cover up the whole sordid affair and just kind of went on as if nothing mattered. One day, God sent the prophet Nathan into David, and Nathan told him a story. He told him a story about a poor farmer who had one little lamb that was like the pet. It was like almost like a member of the family. Next door to this poor farmer, there was a very rich landowner that had huge uh, flocks of sheep and herds of cattle, and the rich man had company, and he, he needed to prepare, prepare some food, but he didn't want to give up any of his lambs. He needed them for himself, I and mean, he was looking to grow them up so he could shear them and sell the wool and all that. So what he did, he came over and he stole the poor man's lamb, and he killed it, and he served it to his guest. David heard the story. David was furious. David said, that shouldn't be. He said, that man, uh, and, and he just started throwing out this whole litany of things that he was going to do. He, he wanted that man to be executed for what he did. David went far beyond what the word of God said. God said, you return you, you, uh, fourthfold for what, for what you stole. And David wants the death penalty there. Um, here, here's David. And by the way, David in Psalm 51 is crying out for the mercy of God. But when it all started out, David had no mercy for a fictitious character in a story. To love mercy, to love mercy. God says, you, 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 you want to honor me? You want to please me? Do justly. Render righteous judgments, righteous verdicts. Number two, love mercy. Be quicker to forgive than you are to criticize. Be quicker to praise than you are to complain. Be very slow to, fall, to find fault. And if you do, stop and just take a moment and say, am I guilty of the same thing? And oftentimes you find out not only are you, but probably to a greater degree, to love mercy. That governs how we deal with each other. That, that, that gets away this judgmental attitude. That, that gets away this critical stuff that goes around, even among God's people, to love mercy. When I think of loving mercy, I think of Moses. Moses was a man who, adored, who, who endured so much abuse from the hands of God's people. Nothing that man did was, all, was, was ever right. If they got manna, pretty soon they're grumbling about manna and they're blaming it on Moses. They got thirsty, they blamed it on Moses. They didn't like the route they were going on, they blamed it on Moses. Moses was just following God. He was just telling him to go where God told him to go and, and, and all of that. And, and every time he turned around, they're criticizing and they're murmuring. And they're, I mean, it started out from the moment he showed up in Egypt and said, God sent me to deliver you. And they were all excited for a while until Pharaoh got mad and, and took away their straw and said, you're going to go out and find your own straw but make the same tale of bricks. And then they're all mad at Moses. You're here to kill us and you, you've made us stink in the eyes of Pharaoh and all that kind of stuff. That was Moses' ministry. Talk about an ungrateful people. That's what he dealt with. But while Moses was up on Mount Sinai receiving the law, the Ten Commandments, and all of those things, Israel corrupted themselves with the golden calf and began to worship in, in the ways of pagan Egypt. And God was furious, and God told Moses, and, and, and Moses came down and saw all of the immorality and all of the filth that was going on with, with God's people. And God said, let me alone. He said, I'm going to destroy them in my wrath, and I'm going to start over, and I'll make a new nation of you. And if anybody had the, had the reason to stand back and say, I agree with you, wipe them out, it was Moses. It was Moses. But that wasn't Moses. Moses fell on his side, please don't do this. I know what they are. Please don't do this. God, if you do this to them, the Egyptians will think that you're a mean, unfair God. They won't understand. God, forgive them. In fact, God, if you can't forgive them, then blot me out of the book. Let me die and go to hell in their place. That's a man who loved mercy towards people who didn't deserve any. By the way, anybody here deserve mercy? We don't deserve it from God, but every time we fail him, we go to him pleading for it, needing that mercy from God. God said, I want you to love showing mercy just the way you love receiving it at my hand. When I think of mercy, I think of, I know I just talked about David and Uriah and, and Nathan and all of that, but there's another uh, aspect of David's life where he showed a mercy that I don't understand, Brother Wilson. 
Almost from the time that David entered the service of Saul, he found himself at odds with the king. Saul had already backslidden. God had already said, I'm going to uh, take the kingdom from you and give it to somebody better than you, a man after my own heart. And pretty soon, Saul began to figure it was going to be David taking over. David's reputation was climbing and Saul's reputation was dipping. And uh, uh, Saul became jealous and eyed David and started chasing him. And David spent decades being tormented by King Saul. He was lied about by King Saul. Saul tried to murder him publicly on more than one occasion. Saul made David's life an absolute disaster. David had to send his family out of the country just to keep themselves, them safe from the, the reaches of King Saul. Yet when King Saul died in battle, David wrote a song. And in 2 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 23, here's what he said. Saul and Jonathan were beautiful in their lives. Is that what you would have said about a guy that treated you the way King Saul treated David? David never one time after the death of Saul mentioned any of the wrongs that Saul did to him. Never ever. He just said David and, or Jonathan and Saul were beautiful in their lives. He loved mercy. He loved mercy. There's a third thing that God says, and I'll hasten. He said, to walk humbly with thy God. To walk humbly with thy God. By the way, there is no other way that you can walk with God than to walk in humility. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 57. We need to be careful, beloved, of a spiritual pride that said, I love God more than you do. Of a spiritual pride that said, I'm, I'm far deeper than anybody else in the church. We need to be careful of that because that's not the spirit of Christ. Jesus said, I am meek and lowly in heart. Isaiah chapter 57, the Lord says in verse 15, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and what? Humble spirit. To revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Micah the prophet tells us, God says hey, this, number one, you need to do justly. You need to render righteous judgments, and that only comes as your life lines up with the word of God. Number two, you need to love mercy. You need to love mercy, as much, to show mercy as much as you love to receive mercy. And number three, you need to walk humbly with your God. See, they were coming in and offering all the sacrifices and checking everything off their list, but they had no relationship with God. And they thought that that's all God cared about was getting his sacrifice, getting his offerings, getting it, get that. And, and God said, I, I want you to walk with me, but you need to walk humbly with me. See, God can't teach us anything unless we're humble. God can't convict us of anything unless we're humble. God can't help us unless we're humble. Listen carefully. God won't have anything to do with us unless we're humble. Turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 5, and I'm, I really am almost done. So those of you that ordered pizza, tell them not to bring it. You don't need it yet. Look at 1 Peter, if you would, please. In chapter number 5, in verse number 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of ye be subject one to another and be clothed with what? Humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. We've talked about this verse. We've tried to illustrate this verse just a little more. Brother Tim, may I borrow you for a moment? And I won't mess up your tie or anything like that. Here, here's what God says, and here's how we've, we've, we've always illustrated. Tim's a Christian, but he walks in pride, and I'm the Lord. He needs God to answer prayer. He needs God to work in his life, so he approaches God. He approaches God, but God resists him. So he tries to approach God. God resists him. Stiff arms him. Why? God resisteth the proud. But that word, thank you, Brother Tim, that word resist is a whole lot stronger than that. I, I was looking it up in Vine's, uh, words, or Vincent's word studies and uh, so forth, and that, that word resist is an incredibly strong word. I, I mean, it, it's a strongly powerful word. 
What it means that God resists the proud, it means that God sets his forces in battle array against them. So what it means, Brother Tim, if you're walking in pride, God sets, he's called the Lord of hosts. That's the Lord of armies. God despises pride so deeply that he sets all of his armies in battle array against you. It's not God stiff arming you. It's God's got his armies and they're gunning for you. That's what it means God resisteth the proud. God has no time for that. Has no t- Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Another one of the Beatitudes. God, re- God reduced Nebuchadnezzar to a blithering animal. Because he had such an exalted notion of himself. And God left him like that for seven years until he finally said, the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men. I am nobody. That's how much God hates pride. God cast Lucifer out of heaven because of pride. God threw King Saul off the throne because of pride. If I'm going to please the Lord, I have to walk humbly with my God. That means he calls the shots. That means that I don't have pride in my life, in my relationship with you, in my opinion of myself. If I don't walk humbly with God, I don't walk with God, period, to do justly. We need a generation of God's people that will rise up and believe that the Bible is still true and that God said what he meant and God meant what he said, that God hasn't changed his mind about morality God hasn't changed his mind about sin. God hasn't changed his mind about the world. And render righteous judgment. Righteous judgment. There needs to be a bunch of people rise up that love mercy. That love mercy. People are going to stumble and they're going to fall. Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And we need some people... Walking in humility before their God. I want you to think about these things. Would you bow your head for prayer? Lord, for days now, these verses have been just running through my mind and my heart. The Holy Spirit just keeps asking me to do the survey. So how am I doing it? Doing justly. Am I really doing righteous judgment or am I doing what I think? Justifying my actions accordingly. And ignoring the word of God. Do I love mercy? Do I love to forgive? Or am I better at holding grudges than I am at forgiving? Am I better at being bitter than I am at tender loving kindness? Do I walk humbly with God as pride anywhere in my life? Lord, I pray that you'd help us to understand you're not looking for a bunch of people to go through the motions. You're not pleased just because we came to church, just because we did this, that, or the other thing. Oh, we ought to do those things. But you want to make sure we don't omit the weightier matters of the law, judgment and mercy and faith. Speak to our hearts, Lord. If there's ever the need for a generation to arise with the blessing and the power of God in their lives, it's our generation. The time is now. The time is short. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't be the kind of people that you look at tonight and say, what have I done that you're so wearied of me? May we be a people who just walk humbly with our God. Bless the invitation tonight. I pray these things in Jesus' name. With their heads bowed, with their eyes closed, we just stand right where you are. Or just start a song of invitation. This is what God requires. God God requires to do justly. Not what I think, not the world thinks, not what my friends think, but what did the judgments of God render about that issue? To love mercy. To love mercy. we better at mercy or bitterness to walk humbly with thy God God loves us wants to be with us but 
Boy, he resists the proud. What an image of God setting his army against us till we deal with our pride. Judah didn't listen to Micah. Jerusalem didn't listen to Isaiah. And they just kept living their empty, shallow, religious duty. And there finally came a day that God judged them severely. What a lesson for us. But he has showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. It's actually rather simple, isn't it? Father, thank you for the Bible. Thank you that you've given us a book of absolute truth. Thank you that your judgments are true and righteous altogether. We can trust them every time. May we become a people of the book again. But while we do that, may we not become a haughty people. May we not become a self-righteous people. May we do justly and at the same time still love mercy. And may we just always be a people that realize we don't deserve your grace. We don't deserve your goodness. And may we be a people who walk humbly with our God. Please dismiss us with your blessing tonight. Lord, a lot of needs in our, our, our church with health needs and all those things. Just, just help your people. I just pray for that one more time. Again, dismiss us with your blessing. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. Please make sure you greet one another before you go home tonight.